How can other people tap dance to work? What's the secret of that? You find your passion. You find your passion. I was very, very lucky to find it. You know, when I was uh, seven or eight years old, and you know, and, and fortunately, my children have found their passion. My, you know, one son loves farming like nothing else. One son loves music like everything else, and, and all three of them love philanthropy and what they get to do. You're lucky in life when you, you find it, and uh, you can't guarantee you're going to find it in your first job out. But I always tell college students that come out, I say, take the job that you would take if you were independently wealthy. You know, that's you're going to do well at it. If you think. You're going to be a lot happier if you've got 2x instead of x. You're probably making a mistake. I mean, it, uh, it, uh, you, ought to, you, ought to, you ought to find something you like that's, that works with that. And, if, and you'll get in trouble if, if you think that making 10x or 20x is the answer to everything in life. Because then you will do things like borrow money when you shouldn't. Or, or maybe cut corners on, on things that your employer wants you to cut corners on. Or it just doesn't make any sense. You won't like it when you look back on it. Three things in hiring people look for integrity, intelligence, and energy. And he said if that person didn't have the first two, that the latter two would kill them. Because if they don't have integrity, you want them dumb and lazy. You don't want them smart and energetic. It never bothered me if people disagreed with what I thought as long as I felt I knew the facts. I mean, I, there's a whole bunch of things I don't know to think about. I just stay away from those. Uh, so I stay within what I call my circle of competence. You know, and, and, uh, Tom Watson said it best. He said, you know, he said, he said, I'm no genius, but I'm smart in spots and I stay around those spots. Well, I try and stay around those spots and I, I just don't have a, a problem if, if uh, somebody says, you know, you're wrong on something. I just I go back and look at the facts. And, and I think that I think that really is much more important, frankly, than, than having a few points of IQ or, or having an extra course or two in, in school or anything of the sort. You need emotional stability. I just read and read and read. I probably read five to six hours a day. I don't read as fast now as, as when I was younger, but I read five daily newspapers. I read a fair number of of magazines, I read 10Ks, I read annual reports, and I read a lot of other things too. So I, I, I've always enjoyed reading, I love reading biographies. Famous lesson about a margin of safety, that you don't drive a truck that weighs 9,900 pounds across a bridge that says limit 10,000 pounds, because you can't be that sure about it. If you see something like that, you go down a little further down the road and you find one that says limit 20,000 pounds, and that's the one you drive across. The nature of capitalism is that people want to come in and take your castle, perfectly understandable. I mean, if I'm selling television sets or something, there's going to be 10 other people who are going to try and sell a better television set. If I have a restaurant here in Omaha, people are going to try and copy my menu and give more parking and take my chef and so on. So capitalism's all about somebody coming and trying to take the castle. Now what you need is you need a castle that has some durable competitive advantage, some castle that has a moat around it. And that moat, that's one of the best moats in many respects, is to be a low-cost producer. But sometimes the moat is just having more talent. I mean, if you're the heavyweight champion of the world and you keep knocking out people, you've got a competitive advantage as long as you can keep doing it. And it's very profitable uh, if you're the one that happens to be able to do it. If you can turn out great motion pictures, I mean, you know, Steven Spielberg, I mean, he, he, he's a fellow to bet on. And, and it has enormous economic value. You'd be surprised at, at, at my days. I mean, they are, they're very unstructured, uh, no meetings, uh, none. I mean, we don't, I don't like meetings. Uh, and uh, I read a lot. Uh, I wish I were a faster reader, I, you know, I'd get more done. But I, I, but I do read a lot, and I, I, uh, I'm on the phone a moderate amount. Uh, uh, our businesses run themselves basically out there. My job is allocating capital and, and I, that's what I'm thinking about. Uh, but I don't like to have things all packed hour to hour to hour. And, and Bill and I are both extraordinarily lucky. I mean, we really get to do what we like to do, the way we want to do it with people that we choose to be around and that are terrific. I mean, we, we've really got everything uh, our way and it's, it, it, we're very fortunate. And 
in his world he has some he has a different kind of pace than I have but we both love it the way we do it and and uh, uh, my guess is that we're each the most productive in that particular mode too because it it, it, it it fits our personalities and, and, and aptitudes kills great businesses if you look at I do, I do believe in looking at history and I, I, I and I try to I, I like to study failure actually and my, my partner says all I want to know is where I'll die so I'll never go there and and we want to see what has caused businesses to go bad and the biggest thing that kills them is complacency I mean you you want a a restlessness a feeling that you know that that somebody's always after you but you're gonna stay ahead of them you, you always want to be on the move and and uh, uh, when you've got a great business, you know, like Coca-Cola, which is, there aren't any like Coca-Cola, but, but uh, you really, the, the danger would always be that you rest on your laurels. But I see none of that, obviously, in Coca-Cola. But that, that, that is the key, to, to compete the same way when you've got 1.8 billion servings being sold daily as when you were selling, you know, 10 a day. And, and that restlessness, that belief that, that Tomorrow is more exciting than today. You, know, you just have to have it permeate the organization. Who was Ben Graham? He, he was your primary mentor, model? He was a wonderful man, and he was my professor at Columbia. I read his book when I was 19 at the University of Nebraska. And I'd started investing when I was 11, and I started reading about it when I was like seven. So I going through all, I read every book in the Omaha Public Library that there was on, by the time I was 12, on, on investing in stock market. And I had a lot of fun, but I never really found out, I never got grounded in anything. And it, it, was, it was entertaining, but it wasn't going to be profitable. And then I read Graham's book, The Intelligent Investor, when I was at the University of Nebraska. And it pulled that it all just together. opened the whole thing up to me. Yeah, and I, and I named my, my oldest son is named Howard after my dad, Graham Buffett. And, and, he was a marvelous man. Never expected anything from me in return. Ben Graham, in his low in his low teens, looked around and he looked at the people he admired, and he said, "You know, I want to be admired, so why don't I just behave like them?" And he found there was nothing impossible about behaving like them. And similarly, he, he did the same thing on, on the reverse side in terms of getting rid of those qualities. You have given um, a lot of fabulous advice, but what's the best advice that you've ever received? Well, I, I received it in a variety of forms, particularly from my father when I was very young, but I mean, he, he basically, I think, taught me how to live, not that I did it perfectly or anything like that, but I mean, he was giving me lessons, but he wasn't doing it by preaching to me, he was doing it by example, but basically, uh, well, the biggest lesson, in a sense, I got is the power of unconditional love. I mean, I think there is no power on earth like unconditional love, and I think that it, you offer that to your child. I mean, you're 90% of the way home, and uh, maybe days when you don't feel like it. It's not uncritical love. <laughs> That's a different animal. But but to know you always can come back. I mean, that is, that is huge in life. That takes you a long, long way. And I would say that every parent out there that that can extend that to their child at a very young age, it's, it's going to make for a better human being. And you felt like you got that kind of unconditional love from your dad. I absolutely did. Yeah. It's a powerful thing. It is a powerful thing.